Otherwise, it gets one-sided, like Frozen, which was an absolutely dismal and wretched movie. It was mythology. It was. Disney's pretty good at mythology, but Fro Frozen was pure ideology. So it was very annoying to see that. Because in most situations, the Disney movies are pretty good at balancing out the archetypes. So, and that's part of the reason they're, they're so ins insanely popular. You know, they present an archetypal picture of the world. And the thing is, you say, well, you know, I don't have any religious beliefs. You might say that to yourself. It's like, fine, why do you watch Disney movies? What the hell do you think you're doing in the theater? You don't think that's a religious experience? It's just because you're completely clueless about what religious experiences are. You're watching a bunch of pictures. Like, they're drawings. You know, they're of things that aren't even real. And then you're just in there, like, embedded in there. It's got your imagination. So, you say, well, I don't believe in any of that. It's like, yeah, right. Son, come on. You believe in it. Basically, yes. But it's, 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 there's a problem underneath that that's even a bit deeper. Because, like, I think the dominance hierarchy is real. Period. Real. But it's not ex it's, it's a weird structure, because it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's like the, the example I gave earlier, where there's the tunnel, and the train going through it, and the train keeps... At any moment, the train cars are full of different things. Well, the dominance hierarchy is kind of like that. It's actually a dissipative structure. That's t so, a dissipative structure is like a... Uh, you know when you let the water go out of a drain, and you get that coil, that funnel? Well, is that a thing? Well, it's a constant across a series of transformations. It's a dissipative structure. And the physicist Schrodinger regarded people as dissipative structures. So, because our, our, our structure isn't constant, like, I don't know, you've probably replaced every cell in your body, roughly speaking, or at least the constituent elements of every cell, you know, two or three times since you've been alive. But there you are. So you're like this thing that's a permanent structure in a flux. And the dominance hierarchy is sort of like that. Because the constituent elements of it keep changing. But its existence is... Its existence is there. And so, I don't exactly know what to make of a category like that. Except that I'm certainly going to say that it's real. Or, I, if you don't like that, I can say, I don't care if it's real, because all of you act as if there's nothing that's more real than that. So, that'll do for me. Because... You know, that brings up another question. How do you know what someone regards as real? And one answer is, well, you listen to what they say. It's like, uh, no. You watch what they do. That's a much more accurate guide to who they are. Because what do they know about who they are? They've got a vague model of who they are, and it's usually hyper-tilted towards banality and conformity and self-protection and... Deceit and all sorts of things. The metaphor used by Jesus is the wind. You can't see the wind, but you can see the consequences. You can't even see the hurricane, but you can see the catastrophe that falls. Well, that, that, like a hurricane is a dissipative structure, so that, you know, that's a reasonable analogy. And the spirit is often likened to the wind. So, so any other questions? Yes? Yeah. Oh, it's an appalling ideology because the people who created it had the idea about what it should be before they made it. So it's propaganda. You can say exactly what Frozen is about. So it's propaganda. A, a truly mythologically based story, you can never fully say what it's about. You can just talk about it forever and ever and ever and ever. So it's, it's a wellspring of meaning. So... Oh, sure they are. Of course that's what they're doing. Oh, yeah, it's calculated marketing. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It was hyper-politically correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they didn't need men. And, you know, God, give me a break. You know. Just because you need men doesn't mean you have to like them. <laughs> yeah, so, so, I mean, I've thought a lot about the difference between propaganda and art. So, art's actually a process rather than an end product. And with any luck, if you have a piece of art, the process is embedded in the byproduct. And so it reflects the process when you bring it into your house. And so it's an active, 
it's a, it's a crystallized act of exploration. And the real artist doesn't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. They're exploring. I can, I can recommend a film. There's a film made of Picasso in about 1957. And it, it was a black and white film. And it was actually a film of him making a painting. And he painted it on glass so you could see what he was doing. It's really quite fascinating because you can see that he's playing. He sketches it in and then he rubs it out. So then he sketches it in again and he rubs it out and he sketches over here. And it's like there's a real dynamism about it. He doesn't plan it out to begin with. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that as an artistic endeavor too. But Picasso was trying to explore and understand. And you know, I don't know what you know about cubism, but cubism, it's a strange thing. But what he was doing with his cubism was to try to show you that you only see things from one perspective but that things exist in multiple perspectives. So, you know, a cubist painting is your face this way and your face this way at the same time. And so, you could say, well, is that a more accurate way of, of representing a person than just the standard portrait? And Picasso would say, well, in some ways, definitely. Because it captures the transformative element rather than the static element. And so, someone who's a true artist doesn't have a political message. That's funny, because my house is full of ideological propaganda from the Soviet Union. It's just packed full of it. And it's so interesting to, to watch these artifacts because a lot of them were, they're socialist realist, although mostly they're impressionist, really. It's so interesting to watch them because in the painting themselves, there's a war that you can perceive. And the war is, a lot of the people who made these paintings were incredibly talented, really, really skilled because the Russians kept their, their formal academies open. So, the Russians can really paint Impressionism, it's remarkable, but their talents were encapsulated within this but mostly Stalinist ideology. And so in each canvas there's this war between the ideological message and the artistic message. And what's so cool is, the farther we get away from the Soviet Union, the more the art wins. Because in 300 years, there isn't going to be a shred left of that ideology. And all that will be left of the paintings is the art. So. Part of the reason that people are so attracted to art is because the artist actually manifests identity with the process of transformation. And so that's why the artist is a cultural hero. That's also why every nihilist worth his salt wants to be an artist. Like, who are you? <laughs> or, what are you going to say? I'm a nihilist? No, I'm an artist. It's like, no, you're not, but I can see why you want to be. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, just because you're a failure doesn't mean you're an artist. Well, I think it depends on who you are. Like, it's really interesting to me, but I'm really interested in that. You know, and I'm also interested in the way that ideologies co-opt more fundamental processes to, to and harness their energy as a, as a rational and motivating force. And so, for me, these pieces of art, propaganda, are extremely interesting. I mean, it's very interesting to be surrounded by them because I can see this war going on all the time. So, it's very cool. And the art's winning, as far as I can tell. So, that's very interesting. Because they were pure propaganda, many of them, when I bought them. But it's getting farther and farther away from the Soviet Union. So, the more archetypal elements are coming to the forefront. So. It, I think it would depend on the skill of the artist. You know, and some of these artists are incredibly skilled. So, to the degree that there are, there's genuine artistic merit in the painting, regardless of its constraint, that can manifest itself as value. <laughs>